cardiac implantable electronic device in cardiovascular disease with or without dysrhythmia. Our, uh, I introduced the first three speakers. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Zhui Chen from Taiwan. He's a staff cardiologist, uh, Division of Cardiology, Department of Internal Medicine, and National Chen Kung University Hospital, uh, Tainan, Taiwan. So Dr. Chen, please go ahead. Dr. Chen, please. And your sound is up. So would you please on the line for the sound? Dr. Chen, please, please open your sound. Please open your sound. Your sound is off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. And uh, slide, please. Okay, can you see my slide? Okay, that's good. Yes, I will start my topic. Since Chairman's uh, introduction, I'm Dr. Chen from Taiwan. Uh, my topic is best practice of permanent artificial patient modality in symptomatic sinus node dysfunction in the high degree of compressive block. Minimal RV patient, biventricular patient, or his bundle, left bundle branch area patient. So the first part is minimal RV patient. The current ESC guidelines show that if patients in sinus reason, or atrial fibrillation with permanent or paroxysmal third or second degree type two, infranodal two to one or high degree AV block, even a symptomatic permanent pacemaker is indicated in level 1C. In patients with symptomatic sinus node dysfunction, including tachycardia, bradycardia syndrome, pacemaker is also indicated with the level of 1B. Also, the current ESC guideline also recommended that minimize or minimization of unnecessary ventricular patient through programming is strongly suggested with the label of 1A. Why prevention of an unnecessary RV patient is very important. We know that unnecessary RV patient will reduce the generator longevity. Numerous studies has demonstrated the unnecessary RV patient can exacerbate a certain heart outcome. In the DAVI trial and the intrinsic RV trial, unnecessary RV patient will increase heart failure hospitalization and the mortality. In the self pace trial, unnecessary RV pacing will increase persistent atrial fibrillation risk. In the most trial, unnecessary RV pacing will increase the chronic atrial fibrillation and the heart failure risk. Based on these studies, the ESC guidelines suggest that for patients with sinus node dysfunction, the default setting of mode is DDD or DDDR mode with AV management. It also suggests that AV delay programming should avoid more than 230 milliseconds and the specific algorithm to avoid reduce unnecessary RV patient is very important. So in Medtronic device manage ventricular patient or biotronic AV hysteresis or ISR plus also suggested. The second part is biventricular resynchronization therapy. Because many studies has shown that if the patient had a heart failure, LV ejection fraction less than 40 to 50% and the AV block or RV patient more than 20% regardless of NYHA functional class. CRT or by then patient is suggested to use in such patients and the, the evidence level is 1A. However, in many countries, because of the insurance issue, conventional pacemaker is still 
the standard therapy for this kind of patient. This slide shows the management of AV junction operation in patients with permanent atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation unsuitable for air for a brace. For this patient, if well control heart rate is achieved and the patient are the candidate for CRT and the QI's duration more than 130 milliseconds and the bivalent patient is more than 90 to 95%, no AV junction operation is needed. If biventricular patient less than 90%, Every junctional operation is suggested with 2A indication. If the patient or candidate for AV junction operation and the LV ejection fraction less than 40%, CRT is class one indication. If LV ejection fraction more than 40%, the less than 50%, CRT is class 2A indication. His bundle patient is a uh, the is an alternative option with 2B indication. If the patient had the normal LV ejection fraction, conventional RV patient was suggested with 2A indication. And the CRT or his bundle patient is 2B indication. The third part is conduction system patient, including his or the bundle branch area patient. This slide shows the his bundle pacing system. Usually, we can find the his potential and the localized his. It could be classified to atrial or ventricular his pacing sites. Also, it could be non selective or selective his pacing. Irrespective non selective or selective his pacing, more narrow QRS duration could be obtained. However, the relative narrow setting outputs may limit the usefulness of the his patient. The team of Dr. BJ has shown that long-term performance and the safety of his patient in 2019, the capture threshold will be increased after implantation for three years, even more than 2.5 voltage. The percentage will be near 30%. This phenomenon will limit the his patient use in the future because it will lower the battery longevity significantly. Based on the possible high threshold after implantation of his patient, a backup RV patient lead may be indicated. The advantage include the increased safety beta sensing and the beta pacing threshold. The disadvantage include the higher cost, more hardware, more risk associated with the additional late, more complex programming and of label use. So the current ESC guideline recommended that when patients are treated with his bundle pacing, Programming should be tailored to its specific requirements. A RV lead as a backup lead is 2A indication. His patient can be considered as an option for CRD candidate in whom CS lead is unsuccessful. It may be used in combination with a ventricular backup lead with patients indicated for pass and the spread strategy. The classification is 2B. And it may be alternative to RV pacing with AV block with LV ejection fraction less than 40%, where more than 20% ventricular pacing is anticipated, but the label is 2B. The another conduction system pacing is left bundle branch area pacing. The definition of left bundle branch area pacing is by anatomy, location, and the EP characteristics. The current ESC guideline indicated that alternative RV pacing site including, include pacing from the RV OT, the mid or high RV septum, his bundle pacing, parahesian pacing, and the left bundle branch area pacing, which include LV septal pacing and the left bundle branch pacing. 
This slide shows the detailed anatomy of left bundle branch area, include the left bundle branch trunk, left anterior fascicle, left septal fascicle, and the left posterior fascicle. The typical QIS pattern in each location was shown here. The difference is in QIS axis and the precordial airway transition. The first published case is from Dr. Huang in 2017. The clinical outcome of this case showed more stable threshold and the sensitivity. Also, the echo parameters, the cerebrum P level, all improved after the first left bundle branch area patient. <clears throat> so the his or left bundle branch area patient would be compelled to see which modality is better. Most important is the physiology. His bundle patient will preserve RV and the LV synchrony, but left bundle branch area only LV synchrony. However, more technical challenge in his bundle patient more increased chronic stress hole in his bundle patient and the more complex programming in his bundle patient. Although the bundle branch area is better than his bundle patient in several aspects, including no RV backup lead is necessary, longer battery longevity, and the relative easy AV junction abrasion, the bundle branch area has more septal perforation risk. However, this complication seldom cause life-threatening events. Therefore, compared to his bundle patient, the bundle branch area patient has more benefits in our daily practice for patients with indications for permanent pacemaker implantation. Furthermore, bilateral bundle branch area patient has been developed and there may be an alternative in the future. However, currently, no clinical relevant data has been published. We did not know whether bilateral bundle branch patient is superior or inferior to his patient or left bundle branch area patient. This slide shows the Dr. Huang's suggestion. If maintenance of ventricular synchrony is required, the high percentage of ventricular patient is needed. The first target size is proximal his bundle, then distal his bundle, then left bundle branch area. The final is LV septum. If YQS, if YQS with typical complete left bundle branch block and the CRT is required, the target sequence is the same to the patients with narrow QIs. For right bundle branch block, there is no well established answer. For intraventricular conduction delay, his bundle patient or left bundle branch area patient could be the choice. If all failed, heart or heart CRT or large CRT is the final option. Otherwise, the current gengiver, gengiver, gengiver patient protocol also suggest that if the patient with normal his concussion or right bundle branch block, his bundle patient is the first choice and then if threshold more than 1.5 voltage, the bundle branch area patient is suggested. If the patient with HV block or left bundle branch block, the bundle branch area patient is the first choice. And if combined reduced LV ejection fraction or heart failure, CRTP is still first suggested. Here, I will show you two cases. The first one is a 23 years old female patient with congenital high grade to complete AV block. This is her 12 lead ECG. Complete AV block with junctional escape fits with right bundle branch block pattern and the left posterior fascicle block pattern. <clears throat> the 24 hour holder documented intermittent junctional escape reason and the ventricular escape reason. Based on the current opinion of expertise, I choose to implant a his patient system for her 
and the QR's duration is 100 milliseconds. Compared to her baseline ECG, more narrow QR's was obtained. Considering the possible increase in the threshold, the two-year follow-up data was shown here. No significant increase in RV threshold was noted. The second one is the 24 years old female patients with congenital 2 to 1 to high grade AV block. Symptomatic exercise intolerance was also noted. This is her baseline 12 lead ECG showing 2 to 1 AV block with the right bundle branch block and the left posterior fascicular block pattern. The QI's duration is 120 milliseconds. Her treadmill exercise test showed the maximum heart rate was 76 BPM, which was far away from her maximum prediction heart rate. The electrophysiology study showed the prolonged HV interval and the intra infrahesion block was also noted. According to current expertise opinion, I implant the left bundle branch area patient for her, and the QI's duration is 118 milliseconds, which is shorter than her baseline. So finally, this is the final slide. The take home message was, for patients with symptomatic sinus node dysfunction, minimized RV patient is recommended. Many default settings such as managed ventricular pacing or metronic was suggested. For patients with symptomatic high grade or complete AV block and the reduced LV ejection fraction, whether AF or not, CRT is first recommended. His bundle pacing or left bundle branch area pacing may be the alternative. For young patients with symptomatic high grade or complete AV block, and the normal ejection fraction, his bundle or left bundle branch area patient may be the future direction. And I think shared decision making with your patient is very important. For elder or multiple comorbidities patients with symptomatic high grade or complete AV block and the normal ejection fraction, conventional RV patient may be suitable. However, his bundle patient Left bundle branch area patient or lilies pacemaker may be the future direction. And I also suggest shared decision making with your patients. This is uh, on my topic and the uh, case sharing. Thanks for your attention. And Dr. Chen, uh, thank you for your presentation. Yes. And uh, I have a few questions, uh, especially about left bundle pacing. Yes, I, I, I know that uh, there, there needs a, a specialized uh, catheter to put the leads on the left bundle. So what kind of catheter is avail available uh, in Taiwan? In Taiwan, we have a choice metronic and the biotronic. We can use th these two types of uh, long sheets and uh, leads for the bundle branch area patient. So is there any difference to use between uh, persons or cases? I, I think uh, if, you, if you do this procedure or uh, more than 20 to 30 uh, case, I think you will be familiar with this procedure and uh, it's not uh, different uh, from your daily practice, conventional pacemaker implantation. I think uh, more than 30, 20 to 30 cases, you will very familiar with this procedure. And uh, I think uh, the septal perforation is very rare in my uh, daily practice. I heard that there is uh, some kind of a learning curve for left bundle pacing. What cases would be uh, enough for uh, familiar with left bundle pacing? I suggest uh, uh, beginning in the beginning, you can choose the six sinus syndrome case because the ventricular pacing is not very dependent. 
And uh, if uh, the procedure is familiar with, uh, you, you can be familiar with this procedure, you can try every block patients. And uh, in my daily practice, no RVD backup is needed currently. Okay, that one more question. Uh, I heard that sometimes the left bundle pacing, initially the cure is, is very narrow, but after uh, a few months later, the QR is slightly widened after, as compared with the first initial presentation. Do you, do you experience such kind of uh, cases? Yes, but I think if the pace, pace QR's duration is less than 130 milliseconds, I think it's enough for these patients because uh, currently the CRT indication is left bundle branch block patent with QI's duration more than 130 milliseconds. So I think um, left bundle branch area patient is the future direction. Okay. Uh, is there any questions from the uh, speakers? Uh, if not, uh, let's move to the second speaker. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you. Yeah. The next speaker uh, uh, on the agenda is Dr. Salem, but he's late, a little bit late for connecting online. So I'll move to the third speaker. The third speaker is uh, Dr. Paul C. Quinta, Quintua from Quintua. Philippines. Philippines. And he is head of electrophysiology in Asian Hospital and Medical Center, co-head in uh, Makati Medical Center, Philippines. And his uh, topic today is uh, uh, wearable ICD, permanent ICD, or CLT ICD following acute myocardial infarct infarction, complicated with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, timing and candidate identification. So please, Dr. Quintua. Okay, can I share my screen? Okay. So good afternoon, can you hear me? Okay, you're very yeah. clear. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here. So we'll be talking about wearable ICDs, uh, permanent ICDs or CRTDs following AMI or acute myocardial infarction complicated with HEFREF, timing and candidate identification. So I have spoken in behalf of different pharmaceutical and device companies, but this talk is not sponsored lecture. So sudden cardiac death, um, usually is caused by ventricular tachycardia or VFib, sometimes PAEs, and more than 80% in studies occur in patients post-ACS or those with underlying CAD, so they belong to the very high-risk population. Majority, 83% occur after discharge, mostly uh, likely because of the adrenaline surge, uh, because they're now more ambulatory, uh, while in the hospital, they're usually bedbound. And one out of third, one out of three out of hospital arrest is attributable to VT or VF. And the survival is dismal, uh, less than 20%. So we need to do better. Uh, one strong predictor is LV systolic dysfunction. As you can see in this particular um, graph, the different studies show the total mortality and sudden cardiac death mortality at the end of the study period. So the, in the low EF population, the total mortality is quite high, 15 to 40%. And about half of this is due to sudden cardiac death, hinting that EF may be a, an important risk predictor for sudden cardiac death. So what about specifically post-MI patients, the topic of this talk, uh, complicated with um, LV dysfunction? You can see here the sudden cardiac death rates in post-MI patients with LV dysfunction post-MI, uh, the mortality, total mortality uh, is about up to high as 32% in the MADIT. And the arrhythmic mortality is still again 50% or thereabouts of the total deaths. So, and here is the data showing the LVEF, which is inversely related to the um, risk of sudden death, meaning the lower the EF, the higher the risk of sudden cardiac death. So as you can see here, if the EF is less than 30%, 
the risk of sudden cardiac death is highest at 7.5. And if the EF is above 40%, the risk is a little bit lower at 2.8%. So, but as you can see, 56 or more than 50% of all sudden cardiac arrest victims had an EF of more than 30. So it's a predictor, but it's not uh, the best predictor out there. Here is where the defibrillators come into play. Earlier trials uh, in patients who did not yet have a secondary prevention indication, so for example, no, no um, uh, VF or no aborted sudden cardiac death yet, uh, but they already have high-risk features because they are post-MI and they have heart failure and low EF. have shown that if you give uh, if you implant an ICD at an appropriate time, the overall death as well as the arrhythmic death decreases compared to just medical management alone. And just look at the MUS trial. So this is a small trial, but the arrhythmic death was reduced by 73% uh, once the ICD was implanted. Now, made it too, also had a good data, 62% reduction in terms of arrhythmic death and 31% in terms of overall death. So just, we'll just look at two studies in detail so that we can uh, see where the recommendations come from. So made it one, one of the granddaddies of the studies, involved 196 patients more than three weeks post-MI, so re remember that, uh, with low EF of at least 35%, non-sustained VT, and a positive VT inducibility study, and they randomized the patients to either ICD implant or conventional medical therapy, largely amiodarone. So as you can see, in the EPS-positive patients with an ICD, absolute mortality was reduced by 23% compared to medical therapy. And you just need to implant for ICDs, and you're saving already one life. In the MADIT 2, this one they uh, did without the inducibility, which is um, controversial, and they involved 1,232 patients, again, not immediately post-MI, more than one month, uh, but most were more than two years post-MI, low EF, 30% or lower, randomized to either conventional therapy, uh, which is medical, versus ICD. And as you can see, mortality was again reduced, uh, 20% uh, in the conventional, and um, there's a 31% relative risk reduction uh, in the defibrillator arm compared to the conventional. And you needed 15 ICDs uh, implanted to save a patient's lives. So it, this is quite significant because in the other medical management, the number needed to treat to save one life is about 30 to 50 and rarely in the 20. So this is uh, pretty good. So this is the uh, latest HA ACC primary prevention <clears throat> guidelines. So patients, when ischemic cardiomyopathy or ischemic heart disease, uh, you look at the EF, which is the main discriminator if it's at least 40 or below. And if the patient already had an MI, but it's already post 40 days after the MI, or if the patient had a REVAS for the MI, and it's already more than three months post REVAS. And then you look at, is there an ICD uh, recommendation? So if you follow the MADIT-1 trial, uh, you do an EP inducibility. If there's an inducible sustained VT, uh, then the patient falls in the class one category for the ICD implant. Uh, if the patient's um, EF is lower, so for example, 35% or lower, but more than 30%, uh, and then there's already a class one recommendation. If the patient's NYHA class is two or three, if the patient's EF uh, uh, if the patient's NYHA class, I mean, is one, then the patient's EF should be lower at at least 30% or below. So as you can see, uh, this seems to be a bulletproof recommendation, except that there's a 14-day wait, 40-day wait, I'm sorry, post-MI if there's no revask and 90-day wait if there's a revask done. So how, where did this recommendation come from? So before we answer that, we just look at, the data coming from the large trials. So this is the Valiant trial. So Valsartan um, in acute MI trial. And as you can see, uh, this is the mortality risk of sudden death 
on the y axis and months after mi and the x axis uh, if the ef is very low like less than 30% or equal to 30% the mortality is very high but in all the quartiles of the mortality uh, or the ef sorry the mortality was highest during the first month so highest rate rate of sudden cardiac death during the first 30 days post mi and this declines and plateaus after a year, even in those patients with an EF of more than 40%. So just remember, made it one and two and mass trials recruited patients who were more than a year after the MI majority or a mean of 18 months. So they don't, they did not really study patients in the immediate post MI period. So we don't have much or we can't rely on the data of the made it one and two and must to answer the question. So so are there studies involving the post, immediate post MI um, period? So there are two. So we'll look at them now. And this is the first is a dynamite trial. So this is 60 to 40 days post MI, low EF, less than 35%. And there's an added criteria, impaired cardiac autonomic function. And again, classified uh, as high risk group. Uh, and they were randomized to either ICD or medical therapy. And as you can see here uh, in the ICD, uh, the mortality rate is very similar to the control group. At the latter part, it actually overtook the control group mortality. Um, so uh, they hypothesized that maybe the ICDs did save those patients uh, from dying very early on because the arrhythmic death was highest. Uh, but later on, because they survived and had maybe progressive heart failure, uh, they will succumb to the heart failure and uh, die within weeks or months. So this is a negative trial, or, or meaning it did not show um, benefit in terms of uh, ICD placement in the immediate peri-op, peri-MI period. So this is just to highlight. So the ICD group had less arrhythmic death that is expected because the ICD prevented some arrhythmic death, but higher heart failure deaths leading to an similar overall all-cause mortality. So one interesting uh, finding there was the higher proportion of VF. So VF usually is uh, uh, caused by ischemia and not by scar. So as we know, if there's a high ischemic burden, then the patient will have recurrent VF. And if the ischemia is not resolved, uh, then the the defibrillator might shock the patient multiple times, but the VF will keep coming back. So the questions uh, during the presentation of the dynamite was that, is the VF a independent marker for mortality? So maybe the patients who died actually had a higher mortality because they were sicker. And even an ICD implant uh, could not have saved them because the prime cause of the death or the ventricular arrhythmia was ischemia and not scar. So ICD shocks uh, were highest in those, they presume uh, highest risk and sickest patients. So, but the bottom line is no benefit in the immediate post MI um, time. So the second trial is the IRIS. So the IRIS enrolled 898 uh, patients, five to 31 days post MI, uh, more generous in the EF, at least 40%. And then two predictors, a high heart rate, um, first recorded heart rate of at least 90, and a non-sustained VTAC on the 24-hour halter monitoring. So here, again, as you can see, the ICD group deaths and the control group were not very different. So 116 in the ICD and 117 in the control. So that means that there's no significant benefit or protection in the immediate Post MI period when, when a defibrillator was implanted. So, another um, question maybe is uh, should we wait? So, why wait? Why wait 40 days post MI if no revas or 90 days post MI if there's a revas attempt or made? So, because there's some studies that show that maybe the EF, which the guidelines is hinging on as a discriminator, uh, may improve. Uh, with medical therapy and revas. So here uh, in this particular trial, so this is the PREDICTS trial. This is a trial um, 
uh, after the VETS trial, so they have had the same uh, population uh, immediately after the VETS. So patients were randomized there and they called the data. And as you can see here, after the wait, 43% um, had the persistently severe or EF of less than 35, but more than 50%, 57% had an improvement. So 26% even had an improvement as much as more than 50% of EF. So at that particular waiting period, the EF is recovering uh, more than 50% initially thought to have an ICD indication would have no more indication after the waiting period. So they identified some um, characteristic, patient characteristics that might uh, predict which patients will improve and which will unlikely improve. So maybe it's fortuitous. So the question now is, what if we just give beta blockers and let the big beta blockers prevent sudden death uh, while waiting? So just remember in the scud heft, though the population is mixed, it's combination of non-schemic, schemic. schemic. Uh, amiodarone did not improve mortality compared to placebo. So now we rely default to the beta blockers. If we look at the Beta blockers studied for heart failure, merit HF involving metoprolol succinate, CBS2 involving bisoprolol, copernicus involving carbedilol. You can see that there's a mortality benefit, but the mortality benefit almost all came after three months. So the mortality risk or overlap with a placebo in the first three months. So maybe it's not a good idea just to give a beta blocker during the waiting period. Of course, we're giving it long-term, but uh, there is no evidence as of now that it might be very beneficial in the immediate three months or so uh, period that we're giving it while waiting for an ICD. So now comes the um, logic about the what we call a wearable cardioverter defibrillator or WCDs. So the WCD has been um, FDA approved in the United States since 2002. And this one is made by Zoll and uh, it has a two components, the garment and the battery pack. So the garment is the one that records and identifies the arrhythmia and also shocks the patient, the battery pack. Uh, it's just like a small tablet. Uh, you can actually answer questions in it and control, get, have some control over the device and it will deliver the energy to shock the patient. The problem with it is that there's some limitations, including compliance, which we'll see later, which is a very big issue, and patient habitus. So, for example, if the patient is obese, the patient might not have the right fit, or the device might not even um, actually fit the patient, so it might be useless. And there's no pacing capabilities. So, for example, uh, we know that if we have an ICD implanted in a patient with structural heart disease, ischemic heart disease, we need the ATP or anti-tachycardia pacing to limit the shocks. And of course, if there's, there are medicines that might cause bradycardia, we also might need post-shock pacing. This, so this one uh, cannot provide that. And in patients post-cabbage, for example, healing chest wounds might be an issue. So there are two pilot studies uh, that they did before the very only one, the big RCT. So the very trial and the by road. So very trial, EF of less than 30%, recent MI, VT within 48 hours, and a high risk feature like a syncope or aborted SCA at least 48 hours after the event. So they already um, had a low EF post MI, but did not meet eligibility criteria for an ICD. By road, uh, longer time from MI or bypass, so within four months, VT within 48 hours of bypass, EF less than 30%, at least three days post bypass, and other high risk features. So the by road uh, included patients who had an ICD indication, uh, but either they refused or they were still waiting for the ICD. For example, they have an infection, so they're waiting for the infection to heal, etc. So total number of patients, less than 300, 12 deaths, six deaths were not sudden cardiac deaths, uh, but it's more important. 24% <clears throat> uh, 
discontinued due to discomfort, and five percent, five sorry, five patients uh, had sudden cardiac death, but they were not wearing the device. So, really, compliance is an issue. And one sudden death wherein the patient was not wearing the device appropriately, so it did not save the patient. So now comes the RCT. So the VEST trial involved 2,300 patients post-MI, low EF, randomized twist to one, wearable defibrillator versus medical therapy. Um, of course, the primary endpoint is looking at reduction in ventricular tachyarrhythmias or death suddenly, uh, presumed to be due to ventricular arrhythmias. And as you can see, the confidence interval crossed the line of unity and there's no significant difference between the control group, sudden cardiac death rate versus the device group. So they are almost overlapping. So the explanation for this is actually poor compliance. So in the treated analysis, meaning if we just look at the data involving patients who actually wore the um, life vest or the WCD, uh, it was actually associated with a 57% reduction in arrhythmic death, impressive and a 70% reduction in total mortality. But of course, we cannot just disregard the fact that most people were not wearing it. So the conclusion was that uh, if we take all the data uh, and not just the patients who were wearing it, uh, it did not uh, significantly decrease the arrhythmic death. So there's some limitations, 5% of the cause of deaths were indeterminate and difficult to really determine if the death was truly arrhythmic. So some died of PEAs, so they had a difficult time adjudicating. And significant decrease uh, in the use due to discomfort, and there are also a lot of complaints because of frequent audible alarms. So we just look at and compare the compliance, uh, because this is the main issue, in the U.S. nationwide registry versus the VEST. So the VEST is RCT, this is non-RCT. You can see the mean daily use in the nationwide registry is 20 hours. If you're not using it, it's ineffective. In the VEST, the mean was only 14 hours. And if you look at the discontinuation rate, uh, as early as two weeks, there's already 20% discontinuation. So patients were not wearing it because of discomfort. Um, they can't sleep properly. They can't wear it. Uh, while swimming or taking a bath or doing exercise. And the discontinuation was actually reached up to 80% at the end of the trial, three months. So really it's a good device, except that it's really not comfortable and the discontinuation is hurting its uh, benefit. So uh, we'll just look at this meta-analysis involving 28 studies. So again, only the best was the RCT, the rest were observational. This involved 32,000 plus patients, uh, but 20 of the studies were either sponsored by Zoll or used data from Zoll. And if you look at the data comparing the overall um, appropriate shocks for three months is five average. Ischemic cardiomyopathy had the highest appropriate shocks in three months, eight per 100 persons. Uh, but the vest is only one per 100 persons appropriate shock in three months. So the observational studies had higher appropriate shocks compared to their RCT. So the most likely explanation is selection bias. So they're selecting patients who they think had a higher chance that they will use the device to make it look better. So in 2016, uh, the HA released a scientific statement wherein you can use it as a two-year recommendation if for example, the patient is waiting for um, definitive therapy like uh, cardiac transplant or LVAD and the patient is to be sent home and there's no more monitoring in hospital. Or if, for example, uh, the patient had an ICD, but you needed to expand it because of an infection, uh, you can have the patient wear the life vest while waiting for the infection to abate. Or if there's a, no ICD yet, uh, but the patient had an indication for an ICD, and there's an ongoing infection and they're, you're still waiting for the infection to resolve prior to the ICD implant, there's a two recommendation for that. So briefly, we'll just um, discuss the CRTD because 
uh, this topic has already been discussed um, in the first talk and will be discussed again uh, in the last talk. So in patients who will need a defibrillator, you should also look at the QRS morphology. And if the QRS morphology is a left bundle branch block and um, the QRS duration is at least 150 milliseconds or more, and the patient is in sinus rhythm, uh, you can actually opt to implant a CRTD instead of just a defibrillator. Uh, the CRT will confer an additional benefit compared to the defibrillator, so the benefit is additive. So the uh, less the, the ventricular dyssynchrony as proven by the QRS morphology, meaning if it's a non-LBBB or the QRS duration, meaning if it's less than 150, uh, the recommendation is uh, less. So we're almost at the bottom of the part of the lecture. So how can we do better to save lives? So we know that CRTs and defibrillators save lives, especially in the higher, higher risk population, including post-MI and HEFREM. We know that EF predicts patients who will die suddenly. It's a predictor not only for arrhythmic death, but also for heart failure death. Uh, but there are other risk stratifications that we can use. So remember the data in the Valiant trial. Even if the EF is above 30, the risk of sudden cardiac death is still high. So, and more than 50% of those who died suddenly had an EF of more than 30%. So maybe in the future, we can use uh, better risk gratification, including a cardiac MRI to um, grade or measure the scar of the patient. And secondly, we know that wearable ICDs um, can actually work as long as the patients are using them. If they're not using them and they are ineffective and useless. So in the future, maybe there will be better designs of wearable ICDs that will improve compliance. And then maybe they will be, uh, they will have a higher recommendation because they will be proven to save lives uh, in terms of total um, uh, mortality risk benefit. So number three, maybe we need better medicines to intervene or improve the ischemia. So remember, um, in the dynamite and iris, um, the, there's no benefit. Uh, and those who got shocked for VF uh, actually had the worst outcome because uh, the, the thinking is that uh, the, the arrhythmia is not uh, just a scar VT or a scar related arrhythmia. It's because of ischemia. So if we are able to reduce the ischemia, then those patients would have survived uh, enough or long enough to get a defibrillator in the future so that uh, they will be protected from a scar ventricular arrhythmia. And we need medicines that improve the LVEF and work faster in preventing sudden cardiac death. So remember the lesson of the beta blockers in heart failure, they don't have a survival benefit very early on. They needed more than three months to provide uh, protection. Uh, but in, um, for example, in the SGLT2 inhibitor, trials, they actually have a survival benefit and improvement in LVEF uh, very early on, as little as less than a month. So maybe uh, with more use of SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, we will be able to save more patients. Uh, and then they might not need a defibrillator long term. So I think uh, with this, I'll end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a simple question. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you mentioned about the recent medications, and we have uh, sacubitril valsartan and uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Those drugs are not available in the study period of uh, Scott Heft or Medit. Yeah. So how, how long and how many drugs do we have to use before implantation of defibrillator? How do you think about it? And what is your, your usual practice? Yeah, so... Um, if you look at the Danish trial, so Danish registry used some ARNI, so, but not the SGLT2 inhibitors. And their, their uptake for beta blocker and ACE inhibitor is very high, more than 90%. Um, of course, the comment for the Danish trial is uh, it's not applicable to this talk. It's non-schemic cardiomyopathy group. Uh, and half of them had a CRT uh, that it did, was not part of an ICD. So the, the comment was that 
the CRT be improved survival. So, but it's an example wherein the patients were very, I mean, the medications were almost all there. The uptake or the compliance for the medication is very well. So you're correct uh, that we don't have data. The data that we are relying on is on patients who were uh, poorly medicated or, well, not as good as what we want. For example, the MOST trial, the beta blocker usage was just 29%. So if the, the theory is if you, maybe if they use the beta blocker more, uh, then the benefit will have been maybe not, not as good. So, um, but for the guidelines, as long as you give guideline directed medical therapy for three months or 90 days, so that includes a beta blocker and an ACE or an ARB. Uh, then it's already what we call um, guideline directed medical therapy. But you're correct. Uh, maybe in the future, I uh, will have more data. Our, if, for example, if we include the RNA and the SGLT2 inhibitor, maybe the after the um, three month waiting period, more recovery will be seen and maybe less people will need ICDs. Uh, but as of now, we don't have data on that. So, but we're very excited to maybe have a study and be a part of that study. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Luizzi, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. To, uh... Good conclusions, Paul, my friend, Dr. Kitu. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Jang, about the wearable ICD, but maybe we'll hear from the other speakers later because it's not available in the Philippines as well. So it's very promising, but as you have mentioned, what's key is uh, risk stratification, right? You mentioned about uh, cardiac MR. Could you share briefly how often you actually do it in clinical practice? I guess it's about... Uh, um, scar quantification, right? And in yeah. lieu of uh, cardiac MRI, do you sometimes use other diagnostic imaging for that purpose, like uh, myocardial perfusion scan, for, for example? Yeah, for in terms of LVEF, uh, it's not just limited to echo. So you can use cardiac MRI, MPI, uh, but there's a class 2B recommendation. For example, if the EF, if you think the um, sudden cardiac death risk is a bit higher than what the EF is showing. I can use a class 2B recommendation to look at imaging, including cardiac MRI. Uh, but there, as of now, none that I know of, that there's a um, recommendation uh, cut off for scar burden. So for HOCOM, for example, we do have some recommendation in some data. But for post-MI um, ACS patients, uh, we don't really have data. So remember, uh, this is just two minutes. So remember, if you have ischemic heart disease, if there's no revast, we don't expect really benefit. So we do expect benefit in the revast. If it's a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, we wait three months because the SCUD have excluded patients uh, during the post immediate three months upon diagnosis, and there's a chance that it might be reversible. So ischemic heart disease patients, higher risk. Uh, we don't expect benefit. Um, if there's no revast done because uh, the, the etiology is not corrected. So the, remember the uh, problem with ischemic heart disease is that the VF is actually higher than in the non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy group. And this is drawn by ischemia. So cardiac MRI uh, usually will show scar. So this might uh, risk gratify patients who might be have, for example, an EF of 40%, but a big scar on the MRI and maybe at high risk of scar VT in the future. But for ischemic in the waiting period, uh, it's I'm not looking at it as a very helpful um, uh, modality, but in the future for scar uh, VT after the waiting period, maybe uh, if the EF is iffy and but you give you get a large scar in the cardiac MRI, uh, maybe they will have some studies wherein there's a threshold and you can already implant an ICD. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Uh, Hidehira Fukaya from Japan. Uh, he is junior associate professor in Kitasato University School of Medicine and is chief of EP cardiology in Kitasato University Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, his topic today is uh, best practice of needless pacemaker implantation in symptomatic bradyarrhythmia, candidate identif identification, and troubleshooting. So please, Dr. Fuka Fukuya, 
please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see your slide and uh, hear you clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the leaderless pacemaker and the potential candidate identification and troubleshooting. Here are my disclosures. Uh, as you know, in 2016, uh, a paper about the latest pacemaker it was published in New, New England Journal of Medicine. And after this pa paper, our practice about the bloody arrhythmia has changed. Today's main talk is about the candidate for Michael and the um, complication of troubleshooting for Michael. So uh, leader space maker is now an established uh, alternative to uh, traditional trans transvenous pacemaker, especially in a patient who only require a belief uh, period of pacing or only require ventricular pacing. Uh, there's a lot of reason to, to the leader space maker. For example, uh, I think this is the most important thing is the patient characteristics. Um, if the patient only has uh, transient arrhythmia or higher age, is a good candidate for Michael concerning the battery longevity issue. Um, uh, Michael implantation does not need the skin sutures, so the patient with dementia, patient having cosmetic or occupational lesion, and the active lifestyle is another candidate for the Michael. Another issue is anatomical problem. The patient have the vascular occlusion due to residual release, thrombus, or vascular shunt, or patient on hemodialysis, or a patient having a risk of pneumothorax. They are all uh, good candidates for Michael. And also the patient after complication of a traditional trans transvenous pacemaker, for example, pot post lead extraction or pocket infection or multiple residual release. Also, the, the patient have a higher risk of uh, trans, traditional transvenous uh, pacemaker implantation. For example, the infection patient or compromised host, such as taking an immunosuppressive agent or a patient having an issue about the tricuspid regurgitation or so. So however, the only one thing is, the only one uh, problem of this micro was the only VVI mode could have been available. This paper uh, was just published in 2020 from Japan. Uh, they compared to the clinical event between the VVI micro pacemaker and the transvenous DDD pacemaker. As you can see here, they evaluated a couple of, of a clinical events, but the heart failure readmission is higher in the BVI leaderless pacemaker compared to GDD transvenous pacemaker. So BVI mode is may may uh, may have uh, some trouble. So a couple of years ago, the micro AV was launched. This pacemaker can AV synchronous pacing. Uh, let me uh, explain ab about the detection of atrial signal between the TV uh, pacemaker and micro. As you know, TV pacemaker <clears throat> can detect the elect uh, atrial activation by electrical sensing with LA lead. On the other hand, the micro can detect the atrial signal by mechanical sensing by accelerometer on the device. Micra has the three different direction of accelerometer which can detect the atrial blood flow like this. So in this paper, the Micra AV can uh, achieve the similar uh, 
synchronous ABP seeing over than 80% in the AB block patient. So micro AB might change our practice. So the merit of the micro AV is that we can choose the BDD mode in this micro AV. Now this system, over than 80% of synchronous pacing can be achieved with multiple accelerometer on this micro itself. However, we can still have some trouble, uh, problem on this micro system. As you know, the longevity of the valley is unsolved issue. You know, the micro cannot easy to, cannot exchange or remove easily. The another issue on micro AV, the implant position is not easy to manipulate. So the, the good, getting a good A signal is to be by chance. So next topic is the complication of the troubleshooting of the micro. Um, as you know, the overall complication rate is less in micro than the T trans, uh, traditional transvenous pacemaker. However, the type of complications are different between micro and transvenous pacemaker. In terms of the pericard diffusion, probably my, micro is more. The infection is my, in uh, micro is less, and of course, lead trouble. Micra doesn't have any trouble in the trouble. So let me explain about the pericardial effusion. This is the first paper that I already shown you. The overall complication, major complication rate is was um, less than 4% for one year. Looking at the detailed complication in the study, the traumatic cardiac injury and cardiac perforation or effusion was reported 1.6%, which was the most frequent complication. So after the launch of the MICLA in Japan, Professor Kyoko Soejima reported the initial experience the MICLA implantation in Japan. As you know, our Asian population have are the small and lean population. And the case number is a little bit small, but all of uh, all cases were successfully implanted the micro and there are no complication. So the micro is safely implanted even for our small and lean Asian population. But was it real? Medtronic uh, quarterly reported the incidence of the cardiac tamponade population in Japan. As you can see, just after the launch of the micro, the incidence of cardiac tamponade population rate is 1.4%. It is not so low. Of course, the complication rate gradually decreased, but there is some complication there, about 1.6, uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 percent. Looking at the timing of the cardiac tamponade overpopulation, about 55 percent of the, this complication occurred during the operation. The remaining 45 percent complication occurred after the operation. So we should carefully observe the patient at least within 24 hours. This paper uh, evaluated the predictor for pericardial effusion during the micro implantation. Totally 2,800 patients were uh, evaluated in the study and the overall weight of the pericardial effusion was 1.1%. It is not so high. I think it's uh, acceptable, but in this 32 patient, three patients were died within 30 days. 
So fatal weight is about 9.4% is it is quite high. So the operator con should consider not to um, get uh, carefree uh, perform the um, micro implantation without this complication. So they evaluated uh, some factor associated with the pericardial effusion. As you can see, the low body mass index, less than 20, at age of about 85, and concomitance with the COPD is uh, associated with the pericardial effusion, which uh, already uh, reported the same uh, factors. So they made a risk scores using these factors. They were divided in three category, low, intermediate, and high risk. As you can see, in the patient with high risk pericardial effusion patient, probability risk of the pericardial effusion is more than 4%, so which is quite high. And also, the repeated deployment is another factor to increase the uh, pericardial effusion. As you can see, the patient with a low risk patient, much repeated deployment does, does not increase the pericardial effusion. However, intermediate or high risk patient, repeated deployment of micro did increase the pericardial effusion. For example, over the five times deployment of a micro in high risk patient, the probable effusion, uh, pericardial effusion rate is over than 20. It's quite high and uh, maybe sometimes fatal. So we should not repeat the deployment. We should try to deploy the micro once. So repeated deployment may have other, other risk. I'm gonna show you our case, 75 years old female with uh, transient AB block. And we deployed actually twice or three times because of the uh, unsatisfactory threshold. The finally, the, we, can, we could do implant the micro successfully, but about one month later, she uh, underwent coronary angiography because of the other reason. As you can see, minor coronary perforation were observed. Actually, I reported the, this case uh, on Circulation Journal. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, this cardiac population did not affect her um, hemodynamics, but the deployment of the micro may cause the a severe complication. So my message is the once deployment is better. So uh, I'm gonna show you the next uh, case. She had, um, DV, uh, post DVR and the TAP, uh, tricuspid annuloplasty. As you can see, she had a giant right atrium and a small annulus of uh, tricuspid, uh, small tricuspid annulus. And, uh, you know, it is very difficult to pass through the micro to RV, but hope, uh, fortunately we can do that, but it was so difficult to manipulate the micro on the RV. So we repeatedly check the good position with injection with no contrast, but it was so hard. So finally, after the eight or nine times injection, we finally found the good position here. And then we deploy the micro here. So we could get the good um, pacemaker parameters and there are no complications. So my message is one deployment, not the repeated deployment micro uh, to reduce the complication. 
So I'm going to show one good paper from Japan. Uh, Dr. Togashi uh, reported the uh, successful implantation chips. They evaluated the um, angle of the micro implantation with the fluoroscopy. They evaluated the one, uh, 104 deployments and they evaluated uh, the good threshold or not satisfactory um, threshold. And as you can see, more flattened position of micro is better, uh, better position. They evaluate the cutoff value of the, this angle, the six degree in REO, 30 degree of LAO is the best cutoff value to get the uh, better acceptable threshold. I'm going to show you, I'm going to a little bit explain about this angle. Uh, this is my case. I think this is a, it was an easy case to implant a micro, but you know, I put the micro middle of the uh, uh, right ventricle. As you can see, I got some gooseneck shape like here. The angle is not so bad. However, I checked the aerial view. The micro position was not good. The axis is a little bit vertical. Therefore, I pushed forward a little bit. And then I got the better position like this. The better gooseneck and the lower angle in RA of view. And good position in area of view, much flattened uh, angle. And then we put the micro here and we successfully implanted the micro once deployment, one deployment. So next topic is the infection about the micro implantation. This paper was from Duke University. They implanted the micro after the device infection. Uh, about 40% have the pocket infection and the remaining 60% patient have a bacterial anemia. In total, 39 patients were, were, uh, uh, underwent the lead extraction, device um, extraction, then micro implanted. Interestingly, over the two year follow up, there were no likens of infection at all. This paper was from China. They also um, implanted the micro after uh, device infection. Actually, they are all only pocket infection, but this paper is very interesting. The micro is implanted immediately after the uh, device extraction within the same operation. I think it's a little bit higher risk, but they reported that no recurrence of infection after the micro implantation. So therefore, the patient after device infection are good candidate for micro implantation. Oops. And another issue is the vascular complication because the micro sheath is very thicker. So we usually use the, this vascular closure device, which is called the Parclose by Abbott. As you can see, we use the two, this device. Then after the remove them, this thicker micro sheath, as you can see, there are no bleeding here. So after using this uh, device, we don't have any trouble in the, this hematoma or bleeding complication is around this area. So if you can use this, I definitely de recommend to use this uh, closure device for micro implantation. So this is my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, later pacemaker is not a simple alternative for transvenous pacemaker. 
leadless is a superior potential to traditional pacemaker. Micro VR, VVI mode has a risk of heart failure in a certain patient. Micro AV, VDD mode may improve this issue. But there are some tips to reduce the complication and improve the pacing threshold. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation, Dr. Fukaya. Uh, I have a simple question. Um, as you listed uh, many indications about the uh, little pacemaker, Mm -hmm. Actually, the uh, European guidelines list uh, three about this. First one is uh, pocket infection, and the second one is uh, transvenous you know, uh, access cannot be available, and the third one is hemodialysis patient. Mm -hmm. What is your usual? What is your usual indication for the uh, little pacemaker in your pr real practice? Oh, thank you for a good question. Because, because the uh, little pacemaker is very expensive in Korea because of the uh, reimbursement issue. So we are very interesting, interested in about the uh, indication, what, which, which indication is very best for the patient. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, the most frequent indication in our hospital is the, after the uh, lead extraction due to uh, infection or other issue. And also the uh, hemodialysis patient, um, we don't want to use the um, uh, vascular access. And, but uh, in higher age patients, such as 85, 90, 95 patient, um, and with the less requirement of the pacing, we choose the latest pacemaker. Okay. Is there any question for uh, Dr. Luisi? Yeah. I enjoyed your talk, Dr. Fukaya. Thank you. Um, you have also implanted the VDD micro, right, Dr. Fukaya? Can you share with us the atrial tracking experience with the VDD micro, if it really is able to track very well in patients with sinus rhythm and AV block? Ah, oh, thank you. Good question. Uh, yes, uh, in Japan, we can use the uh, micro AV, which is a VDD mode of the micro. Um, I have not uh, many experience about the micro AV because we can we could use the about one year or so, but the uh, um, surprisingly the atrial detection is very nice. So in our experience, over the 80 or 85, sometimes over the 90% of a atrial uh, contraction can be detected by the micro AV. It's, I think it's very nice and um, it may change our practice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, let me introduce my co-chair, Dr. Luigi Segundo, and he will uh, take over the last three speakers. Dr. Luis, you, are you uh, ready for? Yes, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Happy to introduce the next speakers. Our next speaker is an associate professor, uh, Division of Cardiology, Department of Internal Medicine and Electrophysiology at the Catholic University of Korea, Cardio Cerebral Cerebrovascular Center in Seoul at St. Mary's Hospital to give a talk on the choice of cardiac implantable electronic device in sarcoidosis complicated with AV block or ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, timing and candidate identification. Please welcome Dr. Song Juan Kim. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Kim Song Juan, uh, Seoul St. Mary Hospital, uh, Korea. Uh, my topic is uh, for cardiac device uh, in patient with sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is a systemic uh, granulomatous disease of unknown causes uh, with uh, various clinical presentations. If sarcoidosis patient uh, had no cardiac involvement uh, at the timing of uh, device implantation, uh, 
a physician uh, should consider uh, cardiac involvement in the future. Dr. Dr. Kim? Yeah? Uh, would you please share your slide? We cannot see your slide. Let's see. Can you see my slide? Okay, good. Yes, yes that's sorry. it. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sarcoidosis is a systemic granulomatous disease of unknown causes uh, with various clinical presentation. If sarcoidosis uh, patient uh, had uh, no cardiac involvement uh, at the timing of device implantation, a physician uh, should consider uh, cardiac involvement in the future. A patient with cardiac sarcoidosis is known to have poorer prognosis than patient uh, with sarcoidosis uh, without cardiac involvement. A half of patient with cardiac sarcoidosis has lung involvement, and 27% of patient uh, has eye involvement, and 21% is skin involvement. This is the largest multicenter registry uh, of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis uh, illuminate CS registry and published this year uh, in European Heart Journal. Among uh, 76 patients uh, who <clears throat> present with uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, uh, 30 patients were already on implantable cardioverter defibrillator and uh, 46 patients received uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillator after diagnosis. Uh, during a median follow-up period of three years, 148 combined events were observed. Combined event means heart all-cause mortality and heart failure admission and fatal uh, ventricular arrhythmia. And 46 a patient heart failure rehospitalization and 99 uh, documented uh, fatal ventricular arrhythmia and uh, 49 all cause deaths. Uh, let me uh, this this uh, a half of patient with cardiac uh, sarcoidosis suffered from atrial ventricular block and 16 patients who uh, experienced ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. This figure uh, shows the uh, cumulative incidence with estimated five years and 10 years event late. Five years event late of a uh, primary endpoint is composite of all cause deaths and heart failure hospitalization and fatal ventricular arrhythmia is 30% uh, at five years and about 40% uh, at 10 years. Well, cause mortality is at uh, is 10% uh, at nine five years and 18% uh, at 10 years is uh, lower than uh, expected previously, and heart failure hospitalization is 12% uh, at five years and 20% at 10 years. How about fit, uh, fatal ventricular arrhythmia? 20% uh, at five years uh, and 30% uh, at 10 years. Let's move on to the uh, device therapy. Mm, implantable cardioverter defibrillator is a uh, uh, life-saving treatment as, as uh, PCI for uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. The risk stratification is more of importance. Pacemaker is mainly a uh, symptomatic treatment. Uh, symptom correlation is important. First, uh, I'd like to talk about pacemaker. Uh, reversible causes uh, of bradycardia is drug, uh, right? Beta blocker, verapamil, diltiazem, digoxin, and hyperkalemia, uh, and acute myocardial infarction. So uh, exclusion of these factors is very important for pacemaker candidates. Bradycardia symptom uh, is various, uh, like uh, dizziness, uh, syncope, uh, exertional dyspnea, 
also a sign of pathologic remodeling uh, for low cardiac output uh, should be evaluated like uh, low ejection fraction and LV enlargements. Uh, symptom correlation is uh, far more important than a degree of a bradycardia. Even if uh, first degree AV block uh, make intolerable symptom, undoubtedly, the patient uh, can be candidate for pacemaker. Usually, more than most type 2 block uh, used to uh, make significant symptom. If a patient has undetermined symptom, uh, more than three second pulse or less than uh, 40 beat per minute of bradycardia uh, could, could be indication of pacemaker. Uh, this indication apply equal to sarcoidosis patients. However, uh, pacing mode selection uh, can be different uh, in patient with sarcoidosis or without sarcoidosis. Uh, these are considerations of pacing mode selection. First, uh, bradycardia can be uh, classified as a sick sinus syndrome, atrial ventricular block, and permanent atrial fibrillation with a slow ventricular response. Second, uh, ventricular pacing, uh, especially RV apical pacing, uh, should be reduced as little as possible. Third, uh, sick sinus atrial ventricular block and uh, atrial fibrillation uh, can be easily combined. It can be called atrial myopathy. So uh, patient with sick sinus syndrome are more likely to develop atrial ventricular block and vice versa. Atrial fibrillation is same. Yeah. Of course, uh, additional lead insertion is much more difficult than de novo lead insertion. So uh, preemptive lead insertion uh, could be permitted. Uh, pacing mode selection uh, should be performed as uh, these considerations. Uh, patient with sick sinus syndrome and sarcoidosis is more likely to develop atrial ventricular block in the future. Therefore, uh, DDD mode uh, can be selected preemptively. Usually, uh, AAI pace mode is selected in the case of uh, sick sinus syndrome. Uh, usually, uh, DDD upgrade rate is 10% uh, for five years. It's uh, up to 50% uh, in case of sarcoidosis. So, uh, patient uh, should consider uh, the possibility of uh, uh, ventricular lead, insert, lead insertion. Uh, in addition, LV apical pacing uh, uh, might be harmful for LV function. Patient with sarcoidosis is vulnerable uh, for heart failure, so unnecessary ventricular pacing should be avoided. Uh, let's move on to implantable uh, cardiovascular defibrillator. Uh, these conditions are uh, associated with ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Any disease with ventricular scar, like uh, ischemic heart disease and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, arrhythmodetic RV dysplasia, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, or even if surgical scar uh, can be, uh, can uh, provoke ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Uh, implantable uh, cardioverter defibrillator is uh, considered when patient uh, experienced uh, aborted sudden cardiac death, uh, and sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia, and low ejection fraction uh, less than uh, 35%. It's similar with patient without sarcoidosis. In case of sarcoidosis, uh, syncope. Uh, ventricular scar uh, detected by uh, ML or uh, PET scan and inducible ventricular tachycardia, uh, ICD can be considered uh, as a class 2 indicate, 2A indication. Patient who need pacemaker for bradycardia uh, can be considered uh, ICD upgrade uh, as preemptive treatments. How about A-lead 
insertion in ICD uh, implant ICD implantation. This is the largest registry for single muscles uh, dual chamber lead. This is the retrospective quote in the National uh, Cardiovascular Data Registry, uh, NCDR, uh, from 2006 to 2008, uh, 2009. Single versus dual chamber. Uh, they uh, authors uh, compared the single versus dual ICD chamber. Primary outcome uh, of uh, outcomes are one year mortality and readmission and device related complication with 19 days. Procedure related complication like uh, cardiac tamponade uh, were much higher, about uh, two times. Yeah. In patient with dual chamber lead, uh, means uh, A lead and ventricular lead. However, uh, long-term morbidity or mortality was same or very similar between single lead and dual chamber lead. These results uh, can be applied in general. However, a uh, patient uh, with sarcoidosis is uh, likely to develop uh, bradycardia like sick sinus and atrioventricular block and conduction of normality in, uh, in the intraventricular conduction disease. So uh, a patient is likely uh, to have conduction of normality like sarcoidosis, uh, dual chamber ICD uh, should be favored. It's published in Heart Rhythm Journal 2013. Let's uh, summary my, uh, my talk. Uh, sarcoidosis is the systemic disease and poor uh, prognosis in case of cardiac involvement. And so more needed to uh, cardiac implantable electrical device, electronic device, and easily combined conduction of normalities and dedicated pacing mode selection and ICD uh, selection is uh, needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Um, in your practice, since uh, our patients with sarcoidosis, we know that it can be progressive and actually lead to heart failure. If, for example, they currently just need a simple pacemaker, do you actually consider implanting a CRT or even a more physiologic uh, right ventricular pacing by a left bundle branch or a his bundle doctor? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Uh, practically, in Korea, it's very difficult to insert uh, yeah. ICD implantation uh, in patient for just a bradycardia pacing. So practically, right. I uh, I perform just a pacemaker uh, patient who need a bradycardia pacing. Yeah, so it's a practically impossible. Yeah, for the reimbursement. Uh, uh, policy. As my opinion, uh, I, I do not think uh, we should uh, ICD uh, in case of just bradycardia patient. Thank you. Dr. Zhang? Yeah, uh, the most problematic issue is uh, how to diagnose sarcoidosis in case Correct. there is no uh, extra cardiac involvement of sarcoid. So uh, the biopsy does not fit to uh, fully uh, disclose the sarcoidosis. So my question is, uh, Dr. Kim, in your case, uh, do you ever put uh, ICD in patients with uh, uh, sarco cardiac sarcoidosis without, without cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis? Uh, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is very difficult to diagnose sarcoidosis without. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, recently, uh, there are very big progress in the cardiac imaging uh, study, uh, like a PET a scan or my uh, heart MRI. So I think we should uh, consider uh, to uh, to do the uh, MRI scan or PET uh, scan for detection and diagnosis of uh, sarcoidosis and evaluate for. 
uh, non-cardiac involvement of uh, sarcoidosis. And uh, we should uh, regular follow-up and uh, co correlation uh, to the patient symptom. Okay. A lot more things we need to learn about sarcoidosis. Thank you, Songhuan. Thank you. I think we're ready for our next speaker. Our next speaker is a consultant, interventional cardiologist, and electrophysiologist. He's, he heads the cardiology department at the Zayed Military Hospital. Um, can we flash uh, Dr. Al Kabi's uh, credentials first? If he's ready. Hi, uh, good morning. All right, good morning. Uh, Dr. Salem Al Kabi from United Arab Emirates. Uh, sorry for uh, missing my uh, lecture at the morning, but it's uh, unfortunately we have an urgent uh, case. No worries, Doctor. So let me see how we can share the uh, screen. Okay. Do you see my screen? Not yet. Can you try share, uh, pressing the share screen again? Okay. I'm sharing the screen, but is, uh, you're not seeing anything. Um, somebody from the team help us. Hope you're able to relax a bit, doctor, after your emergency. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Al-Kabi is uh, trying to share his slides. He will be talking about permanent pacemaker rescue following transcatheter aortic valve replacement, timing and candidate identification. Are you using a keynote, doctor, or PowerPoint? Uh, PowerPoint. And uh, have you tried uh, pressing on the share screen at the uh, Zoom? Yes. Um, I press... The slides aren't showing up? Not showing up. Are oh, there? There you None? go. Can you? Okay. That's it. We see it. Uh, okay, good. So okay. let us start. Okay, one sec. Slideshow. That's it. Okay. I need to hide these things. Just one second. Okay. So um, I will be talking about the uh, primitive base maker uh, rescue following a trans. Uh, the trans uh, uh, catheter aortic valve replacement timing and uh, candidate identification. My talk will be uh, will go through the the following outline: is a uh, incident of uh, pacemaker post TAVI uh, mechanism, the heart block, uh, the predictor of heart block post TAVI, the timing of the heart block. Is there any? Uh, need for extended uh, rhythm recording in a patient post uh, TAVR. Having a pacemaker after TAVR, is it uh, harmful? So let us start with the case. Um, so this is an uh, 85 years old asymptomatic. That's her baseline ECG. If we look to the ECG, you see borderline first degree heart block and uh, right bundle. So you can call it bifascicular, but mainly right bundle. She went through the procedure. And uh, if you look to the big tail and the depth of the uh, valve, they are just injecting here. In the same view, uh, they are um, inflating it now. OK. 
Okay, where the heck? Sorry, where the inflation? I think this is the. So this is the inflation. This is the ECG post uh, the uh, inflation, and if you look at the ECG, her uh, VR interval still borderline to zero nine by the computer saying, but still right bundle. They are maybe a PACs, but they are no complete hard block. This is a 24 hour in the CCU. And you know, clearly from the, at the, here you see they are a complete hard block at the beginning. And then she should go back and uh, um, first degree hard block. She ended having a pacemaker. So when you look to the incident of the uh, permanent pacemaker for post-AVI, uh, the rate of the pacemaker implantation is resistant. The yeah, minimum the, uh, is reported to be around 6.5, but some report is about 17%. Uh, um, if you look to the, uh, comparing to the SAVR surgical valve replacement, the uh, SAVR is around 3.6, but an average uh, is the, in, the, in the tower is 16.6. It depends on the type of valve and also the, with the experience, we have been reducing a little bit uh, of the uh, complete hard block post tower, but still the percentage is not uh, less than uh, SAVR. When you look at it, to the timing uh, of the hard block, um, with the gradual improvement of the technique and the improvement of the surface, we discharge patient early uh, and we were able to reduce the number of the need of the pacemaker uh, before discharge. But if you look to the number of the pacemaker that, and they, after the discharge, they, they are a patient, the incident of the, uh, it's a climbing up that they end having a need of pacemaker implantation later <clears throat> after discharging the patient. If you look to the mechanism of the heart block in the tower, if you look to the anatomy of the uh, AV node and the uh, his bundle and, right, and the left and right bundle course, you, you see the, uh, the, um, the AV node is close to non-coronary cusp and the, uh, the his bundle is go through the uh, membranous uh, uh, septum. And then if you look to this picture, they divide to the left and right as soon as they get, reach the uh, muscular, the beginning of the muscular septal. So um, during the, uh, the, 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 these patients, usually they have a lot of calcium and uh, there are a lot of factors contribute to the uh, heart block in these patients. Sometimes the huge calcium which is a non-coronary cusp, which can be pushed by the uh, balloon or the bar device against the, uh, the, uh, the septum and press and damage the, uh, the conduction system. Also the uh, balloon inflation and oversize, uh, oversizing the, uh, the balloon or the size of the stent, that's also can lead to the, uh, the uh, damaging of the conduction system. Also, the depth of the uh, the depth of the implantation uh, of the uh, 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 valve uh, uh, more than the uh, the uh, the deeper it go, it may damage the uh, the conduction system. So there are a, have been a lot of studies to try to predict uh, which patient are uh, at risk of developing. Uh, Heart block, and the, uh, this is one of the meta analysis uh, published uh, in 2021. And if you look to the risk factor, you know you will notice that the 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 the, the good predictor is the, the the baseline ECG if you have mobile type one or type two. Also, if you have a bifascicular block or a preoperative heart block or right band branch block, these patients, they are at risk of developing heart block after a TAVI. Yes, they age, the older you get because they, I think, more of calcium and the, uh, plus the male is more at risk. Also, the type of valve, if you see the self-expanding uh, valve compared to the balloon, they are more risk. Uh, mechanical uh, also valve or metronic uh, core valve comparing to Edward, they are also more uh, risk of uh, developing 
uh, hard block after a tower. Also, this is another uh, studies published also in 2022. Also showed that if you are if you have a baseline ECG with the right bundle, your risk of heart block is very high. Or if you have had trans transit heart block before the procedure or during the procedure. Also, this is another meta analysis of uh, almost like 100,000 patients. And you look, uh, they are looking for the uh, risk factor of predisposition to uh, heart block. And if you look to this, is bifascular block is also right bundle block. Is these patients is high risk of developing heart uh, block post uh, tavern. And also the type of the valve, uh, the uh, also uh, risk, especially if you have, for example, metronic core valve, uh, you are at risk of more risk of developing heart block comparing to. Edward Wall. We talked about the risk, of the depth of the implantation, and this is another study it showed that um, because you target to be in the annulus and you put a little bit of stress before the uh, the line of the annulus, uh, the deeper you go, the more chance that you will uh, touch the uh, the uh, sub, uh, the muscular septal where the lift bundle and the risk of uh, heart uh, lift bundle branch block and heart block. So this study showed that if a, uh, the patient's uh, membranous uh, septum length is less than 6.43 millimeter, they're at high risk uh, of uh, developing complete heart block. Uh, and the, the, the also the, uh, if, if the, uh, the depth of the, uh, uh, implant, the depth of the uh, of the implantation uh, implantation of the uh, valve uh, more than uh, the uh, membrane uh, septal, uh, your risk is very high also to develop uh, almost ten times. So there are a lot of factors that it may contribute to the heart block. There are some non-modifiable like an age and gender, and they are uh, the the, uh, the they are a risk factor that. It can be modifiable by uh, choosing the type of uh, valve and the trying to avoid oversizing it. Uh, the timing of the heart block, uh, this is in a study showed uh, 181. Um, they uh, follow the patient after the TAVI and none of them had a pacemaker before the TAVI. And you see that they are now Especially with the Edward valve, we see there are some cases it's happening late after discharge. And this is another study also, it's a big registry. Also it showed again that there are cases where the heart block can happen um, almost later to almost 29 days post hour. And this is mainly because the, the new uh, valve, they are self-expanding and keep uh, pressing in the and the annulus and the uh, LVOT. So if the patient can present later, they are uh, is this need for long-term monitoring? And so this is a, a, a Bradley Tower study, which they took 96 patients and they uh, did um, monitoring with a patch uh, telemetry uh, like a month before the surgery, before the Tower procedure and they followed with a month after, and also they extended to total of three months after the procedure. And they found that the monitoring patient with the, uh, before the procedure does not, uh, did not lead to any patient need to have a, a pacemaker implantation before the procedure. Um, there are Nine patients, which is 9.4%, require a uh, pacemaker implantation uh, uh, after the procedure. The patient who have been discharged and follow for a month with the uh, monitoring patch, there are three patients and then have a pacemaker. One developed QRS duration of 174 and drop an ejection fraction. And the second one also, they found they have a double new lift bundle branch block during the follow-up of the first month and also drop ejection fraction, they end doing uh, device implantation and they did uh, his pacing. And there was one patient had the longest pose about 5.5 seconds and he ended having a pacemaker. The, 
the uh, patient who have the, the, the remaining patient with a monitor for an additional two to three months, there was none of them yield that uh, 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 any significant arrhythmia led to implantation of pacemaker, even though they have some patients uh, found to be flutter and they are some pose of four, point sec four, uh, four second pose. Also, this is another study. Uh, they're trying to use a smartwatch uh, post tower, and they took 100 patients, uh, giving them a smartwatch, and they monitored them by the, the application reached to the physician. And there was uh, 30, uh, uh, 34 uh, patients uh, reporting an event. Um, uh, 29 was captured by the smartwatch, and the 20% uh, uh, at end uh, 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 ordering for a patient uh, telemetry, uh, telemedicine monitoring. And the, the yield of all these events, uh, they, they are about 48%, they develop the left bundle branch block. And there was uh, five, five patients, they developed third degree heart block in the follow-up by watch, and they end having a pacemaker implantation. Is the, um, the pacemaker impacting the long term uh, for the patient who have TAVR? And the uh, multiple study and multiple uh, meta-analysis uh, showed that they are uh, patient, if you look at this dot, is the patient uh, not receiving pacemaker. The straight line is the patient, uh, sorry, the, the straight line, the patient without pacemaker, the dot line is the patient with the pacemaker. And we see that the all cold mortality is slightly higher in the patient who uh, receive a pacemaker. Also, this is a Bartner uh, registry, which is around 2,000 patients. Also, they showed that uh, repeat hospitaliza hospitalization uh, is more in the patient who receive a pacemaker uh, post uh, TAVR. Also, the death and, uh, and rehospitalization re also more common and significant in a patient with a, a new pacemaker after the tower. This is also meta-analysis. Uh, it's, uh, it's about 74 uh, studies. Um, and also, it confirmed that the mortality is higher in a patient um, with the uh, pacemaker implantation, which is the blue line. Also, the hospitalization is more common in a patient who receive pacemaker post tower. When you look, when they look to the patient uh, type of the uh, uh, valve implanted and the long term outcome does not affect regarding the mortality in a patient who receive pacemaker. They look to the ejection of fraction. The patient who receive a pacemaker post implantation. They, uh, they, uh, they have been having slightly a drop in ejection fraction uh, comparing to the patient who didn't receive a pacemaker. Also, this is another study. They look to the patient who have a pacemaker and they, if they are pacing more than 40% or less than 40%, and you see that the patient who have been receiving a uh, high pacing percentage or more than 40%, they, they, their uh, survival probability is lower comparing to the patient who did not receive uh, RV pacing, which is expected and we see it in regular pacemaker, but slightly um, prominent in this type of this group. Also, this is another study. They uh, took like uh, almost uh, two arms. Uh, the uh, patient who had a heart block after TAVR, and one arm they did a his pacing, and then other arm they did non his pacing, like regular pacing. And if you look to the, uh, the ejection fraction, you see they are slightly dropping the non his pacing patient, which is significant. Uh, as expected, the QRS duration will be shorter in the or narrower in the patient with the his pacing comparing to non his pacing. And they found that uh, his pacing is. Uh, possible in 85%, um, uh, the, the attempt, the uh, his pacing, it's in the his or in the L, uh, left bundle, and the uh, about nine, nine patients, 33 or 37 patients failed to um, uh, implant the his pacing because of high threshold, um, and then they moved to the left bundle, and they uh, were able to uh, implant it in 
almost 93% uh, of the patient. And if you look to the patient who has successful, his basing in the, in the baseline ejection fraction slightly below 50, they have improvement in ejection fraction, even though you cannot trust this study because it's, it's a small number of patients. This is just a sample of their ECG, which showed uh, QRS very wide and post uh, implantation of lift bundle basing slightly narrow. So when you look to the guideline, if you look to you search for if there are any cons consensus or expert guideline, you will find only it can be published in ACC to, uh, to uh, 2020 about what you do about the patient uh, develop or they have some ECG change. Uh, both tower. And uh, in this guideline or this recommendation that they recommend um, the, if the patient uh, develops symptomatic bradycardia or presents on complete heart block, you implant a pacemaker. If it's a, a new progressive or pre-existing conduction disturbance that change post-procedure, monitor and consider EB study and pacemaker implantation. Um, uh, if the scenario occurs before a tower, and after TAVR, uh, no, uh, uh, no, no need for anything. You just um, uh, follow up a patient as a regular, uh, uh, regular piece. So and I, the, the take home message, I think the still the conventional BRI and BOST oper, uh, operative uh, 12 lead ECG finding is the best tool to predict the need for pacemaker. If the patient have Baseline, no right bundle, the, the, the low risk group, they are no right bundle, and they are uh, uh, in no need for pacing during the procedure, okay, or after the procedure. Recommendation, remove the timber pacemaker, discharge patient, and regular follow-up. If the patient have a baseline right bundle branch block, and no need, there was no need for pacing uh, during tower, procedure and there are no sign of uh, heart block after. Just uh, monitor for 24 hours, remove the, uh, the timbre pacemaker and maybe consider also monitoring a patient with the uh, post-procedure for 30 outpatient uh, telemetry or frequent ECG or a halter or a batch uh, telemetry uh, for about a month. If you develop any change, then you consider them high risk. The high risk group, which they have right bundle, and they develop any sign of heart block during the procedure, you, you implant a pacemaker. If they have no right bundle baseline, but they need pacing during the procedure, after the procedure, if they, if they continue having 20, 24 hours, less than 24 hours, and they recover completely, these patients, and they have no other risk factor, there are no oversizing of the, uh, uh, of the uh, valve, then you may consider outpatient monitoring for 30 days. Uh, or consider EB study here to confirm how, what is HP. Um, and the number, it's very from, there are people who take a 65. If you look to the pacemaker guideline by European 70, um, and there are people who consider 75 as the cut point. If the patient become dependent pacemaker more than 40 hours, you implant a pacemaker. Extensive ECG monitoring before tower or two months after tower is not necessarily, and in fact, it may lead to over treating, uh, over treatment with the permanent pacemaker. So I think the most of the experts they they will recommend for the intermediate um, uh, risk to be monitored for a, a month post procedure. Um, right bundle and QRS duration continue to be the important predictor for a need for post tower uh, pacemaker implantation. Uh, his or left bundle uh, branch uh, pacing visible and it should be considered in the majority of the patient requiring a uh, pacemaker post tower. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al-Kabi, a very practical talk.
you have uh, shown clearly how AV block is very common after TAVR. In fact, it can happen late two to three months after the procedure. But in your own practice, have you encountered patients recovering from AV block, maybe after interrogation of the pacemaker? And does that influence your choice of device and programming? Uh, you mean if they develop a, a heart block during the procedure? And then they recover maybe weeks later on. Do you encounter these patients or not, not much pacing maybe? To be honest with you, the, the, uh, uh, we had like two patients where they are uh, become not dependent in the pacemaker, yeah. um, yes. which is not uncommon. You see it in both surgical uh, and you see it post uh, It's I will consider it, if you look to the literature, maybe around 40, it can reach to 60% what you implant because you see heart block, they may, in one year, they may not be become dependent on it. Um, All right. And Dr. Supporter, I am a Tavi implanter. <laughs> and how, how long do you wait for in case uh, the patient have a complete heart block uh, during the procedure? You can you see at the operating room. And uh, the see, EKG, previous EKG is normal. If they if they if if they have a normal ECG completely and they develop complete heart block, yeah. okay, we monitor them for a twenty four hours. In our um, we'll put a temporary pacemaker. We'll take them to the CCU with a temporary pacemaker. If they completely recovered, uh, to be honest with you, my practice is to do an EB study, confirm which is HV, okay, before they discharge. If the HV within normal below seventy. I will uh, mon monitor them with a, uh, we have like, um, you know, um, a batch. We uh, attach to the patient, we monitor them uh, frequently and we bring them to our clinic. And we ask them if they report any dizziness to come to the emergency room. Yeah. The, the, during the first month, to be honest with you. Okay. And this is uh, depend on the type of the TAVI valve or is this? To be honest. Oh. Well, we, 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 in our uh, hospital, we use only Edward valve, to be honest with you. Yeah. So, um, which is the, it's considered one of the low risk comparing to the other core valve. Uh, yeah. But you know, um, even with the core valve, if they, if they recover, to be honest with you, less than 24 hours, okay. Yeah. Uh, and they, of I will follow them. I will not throw it. Yeah. Because the pacemaker is, is not a simple thing. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. for the patient, it's, a, it's a something later. It's a, a risk from infection, from everything. Because I think it's the, the uh, radio strength of the valve may be different in, 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 in very of the uh, TAVI valve. Yeah. yeah. Some is yeah. Uh, radio strength is very, very strong, like a core valve yeah. or Edward. Yeah. yeah. But some is less, yeah, like a. Uh, Hydra or a particle or something like that. Yeah, the radio say may be less. Yeah, maybe a compression of the conducting system may be less. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so you mean if 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 they uh, if they recover in in yeah, the, yeah may, maybe the valve, you will be more maybe, comfortable maybe, yeah. to leave them. But yeah, if, if it's uh, core, core valve, you will you will consider pacemaker. Yeah, it's for Edward. I think uh, I will. <laughs> I will. For Edward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and in our practice, if they recover, we do we do an EB study. If it's a uh, reassuring, yeah. we close monitoring them. Yeah. We, we, case, now yeah. we, we don't have only one case. He presented uh, three months yeah. with a with a yeah. complete heart block. To be honest with you. Yeah. In now some case, uh, yeah. In some case, I put the uh, permanent pacemaker immediately <laughs> after oh, okay. uh, after Tavi. <clears throat> In oh. that case, uh, the patient have a previous uh, right bundle branch block, yeah, something like that. Oh yeah, some yeah. some. I, yeah. I agree. The right bundle is yeah. very high risk. If they yeah, the right bundle, yeah. if the baseline right bundle and develop any heart yeah. block, yeah. no, we'll blank base maker. To be honest with you, yeah, I agree on that. Yeah, Thank but you. if it's completely normal baseline, completely narrow QRS, uh, I usually if they recover, yeah. less than twenty four yeah. hours. Yeah. I try to avoid pacemaker if it's possible yeah. to be honest. Okay. And the AB study that, that is a okay. good idea. Yeah. Thank you.
would be com good to compile our experience in the region so maybe we're more guided. It's probably a combination of patient factors and the valve that uh, is being implanted, as you pointed out, Dr. Dr. Jan? Um, I have no other, no further question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. al -Kabi. Maybe we'll Thank call you. you later again. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. And finally, uh, our next speaker is a cardiac electrophysiologist from Queen's Kirikit Heart Center, Hong Kong University in Thailand, Dr. Dujao Sahatas. Welcome, Dr. Dujao. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Liuji. Um, okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Do you see my screen? That's it. Please All right. press slideshow. Okay. Please. All it. right. Our last talk, it's about a patient with heart failure. I would like to start with a, a case of a 75 years old lady uh, with Cixana syndrome, and she was implanted dual chamber pacemaker since 2017. At that time, her ejection fraction was normal. Uh, she came to, you know, for routine checkup at pacemaker clinic, but complained of deterioration of her functional class. So that we, uh, we did ECG and it showed that there's a new complete left vertebral branch block. Echocardiogram observed here. There also, uh, even though also uh, preserved LV wall thickness, but ejection fraction reduced from 60 to about 30%. Uh, so coronary angiogram was done and show 80% stenosis of mid RCA and PCI was performed. So now what would you do with this patient next? Whether you're going to give a uh, patient the optimal medical therapy for three months and then the re evaluate echo or upgrade to CITP or even upgrade to CITD or just add conduction system pacing leads. All right, as we know that device for heart failure patient has two main purposes. The first is to reduce heart failure by resynchronization of the LV dyssynchrony. Uh, there are two techniques right now. now the, the, the traditional one is by ventricular pacing. And the normal one is conduction pacing, which claim to be like through physiologic pacing. Well, previous speaker has mentioned about how we implanted the conduction system pacing, but uh, all the implanters who want to even like to get recruit left bundle branch for his button pacing, you're gonna have to put the lead distal enough so that when you stay, uh, give an output to steam and then you can recruit the distal part of the left bundle distal to the block. This is the ECG of patient with his button pacing with left bundle recruit. And this is the ECG of patient with complete, you know, uh, selective left bundle pacing. Well, so far, the current heart failure guidelines from both societies have given a class one recommendation for patients with significant, you know, electrical dyssynchrony, class one recommendation for biventricular pacing, because there are multiple randomized controlled trials like Karachev, um, not this CRT or companion that proved the benefit of biventricular CRT on reducing of all cause mortality and even reverse alveoli modeling. Neither of them have mentioned about the role of conduction system pacing. Uh, well, when we look, where is uh, you know, any guidelines that mention about the role of it? For, uh, in ACC AHA, uh, device guideline on 2018 have mentioned a little bit on pa patient with mid-range of ejection fraction who need we pacing or a we block. You know, they give a 2B indication for his button pacing. The more recent guideline on device of the ESC guideline 2021, uh, they give a recommendation of class 2A recommendation for his button pacing to be rescued, you know, in patient who fell uh, CS lead implantation. Uh, but they also recommend to, you know, uh, to, Im uh, to implant the RV backup lead. You know, another uh, 2B indication for those with EF more than 40% and need repacing more than 20%. Well, because there are no many data of uh, condition uh, system pacing on this patient, on, on, on uh, this type of patient. But what's the evidence now? This is the meta analysis uh, of patient with heart failure who's implanted his button pacing. Uh, they show that mean ejection fraction improved significantly from baseline, about 11%. Uh, 
also uh, in patients uh, with CRT indication. Now, this is the international collaborating study group. Uh, this cohort enrolled patients who underwent uh, lab abundant pacing. I mean, injection fraction is about 30%. What they show is that, is that lab abundant pacing also improved, I mean, narrowed the QAS complex and also improved the mean ejection fraction from 30 to 40%. In both group, uh, in both left butter branch block group and then non-left butter branch block group. What about data comparing between biventricular pacing and connection system pacing? Well, this is a single study, observational single center study comparing uh, patient with three arms of biventricular pacing, his button pacing and left button pacing with one year follow-up. Uh, the narrowing of QAS complex, you know, was observed significant much uh, more comparing to biventricular pacing observed in uh, connection system pacing from both area. Especially the ejection improvement, the LV improvement was significant higher in uh, connection system pacing, right, 23 and 24% as compared to 16% of biventricular pacing. The more interesting is that the super responder rate was higher in connection system pacing group and even normalization of the uh, ejection fraction was found like 70% in connection system pacing group and about 45% in biventricular pacing group. The first randomized control trial uh, comparing his to biventricular pacing, which is called his alternative reported last year. On the randomized 50 patients to BIV and his CRT. On intention to treat analysis, they reported that there is no significant difference of ejection fraction improvement. However, if you look in detail, we found that almost 30% of his pacing group has crossed over because they failed to recruit lab abundant. So 30% cross over to by V group and only 4% in by V group cross over to his group. So for per protocol analysis, there is a significant improvement of ejection fraction you know, as compared to by V. Well, for this year, rate back, back breaking trial on uh, pronounced on HIH 2022 of the LBBP resync trial, it's the first randomized controlled trial comparing uh, between LBB pacing and biventricular pacing. Uh, uh, Dr. Su has reported that LBB pacing can increase ejection fraction, mean ejection fraction improve about 21% uh, significant higher than biventricular pacing, which improved about 15%. Another study also you know, reported, this is the non-randomized prospective, you know, made, uh, conducted in China, comparing between Lebanon pacing and bi -V. But this bi -V is adaptive CRT, which claim that to have you know, the more response rate for CRT mode. So they all, uh, the follow up for one year, they come, uh, the outcome, clinical outcome uh, for this group, since they only follow up for one year, were comparable. But what we observe is that the uh, improvement of ejection fraction is much uh, significant higher in lab abundant pacing group, around 20%, and uh, improved much more than by ventricular pacing group, which improved um, about 15% at one year. Also, the rate of super responder, like the previous uh, uh, study before, super responder rate was significant higher in lab abundant pacing group as compared to adaptive CRT group. Well, we probably look for, you know, uh, as you know, all the studies I mentioned that you know, significant improvement of ejection fraction of the conduction system pacing group compared to by the pacing group. What about the clinical outcome? Uh, Ray Beckering Tai in HIS this year again, uh, we, Dr. VJ reported the clinical outcome of non, uh, the observational study, not randomized, you know, uh, comparing between biventricular pacing group 219 patients versus conduction system pacing group, uh, predominantly abundant pacing, follow up for almost two years, 40% have ischemic cardiomyopathy. The improvement of QAS duration and ejection fraction exactly the same as previous study. But uh, the, the clinical outcome, you know, primary endpoint is a time to death or heart failure hospitalization has found that uh, 
these events significant lower in conduction system pacing group as compared to biventricular pacing group. This significant driven from heart failure hospitalization. Uh, death may be not different. All right, another randomized control trial, which is ongoing now, we, could, we just gonna have to wait for the report, but it's run, uh, they randomized you know, 180 patients comparing between LBB pacing and BIB pacing group. Um, I think they will finish this, the end of this year and a couple more years, we're probably gonna you know, hear the result. Well, uh, this review, it's very good for new implanters to review of the connection system pacing by Dr. Sharma and Dr. Vijay. And then he give a schematic of you know, the mode of CRT according to pre-existing electrical disturbance. If anyone wants to review this, you know, I recommend. Well, let's move to the second purpose of the uh, device for heart failure is to prevention of sudden death. Definite consensus for putting defibrillator for secondary prevention, but the difficult part is uh, the, for primary prevention. Is there any comparison? Okay, let's uh, observe. This slide is shown here. Um, the trials which included in um, meta-analysis uh, for proving the primary prevention uh, in you know, several guidelines that give class one recommendation. However, as you can observe from this graph, which is uh, showing the annual event rate, you know, of both uh, sudden cardiac death and total mortality, as you can see here, there is a decline of event rate in the control group by time, over time, especially lowest in Danish trial. In fact, Danish trial is the only trial that did not prove the benefit of uh, ICD over optimal medical therapy. The reason for this is probably because of the improvement of heart failure therapy, like we uh, other speaker already mentioned about this. If you look in detail of Danish trial, 90% of uh, population in Danish trial already received beta blockers, uh, RAS inhibitors, and especially 60%, almost 60% have CRT. That uh, influenced the prognosis. Uh, is there any compare, randomized comparison between CRTD and CRTP or not? The only the randomized trial is probably this one, which is the post hoc analysis of companion trial. Uh, for companion, companion trial, there are, actually there are three arms, right? Two arms of it, two arms of the trial is CRTP and CRTD, which both uh, improve or cause mortality as compared to optimal medical therapy. Uh, as for all, all overall patients, there's no significant difference in all cause mortality between CITD and CITP. But when they stratify into ischemic and non ischemic cardiomyopathy, surprisingly, they observed that the benefit of CITD was observed in patients with non ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, in non ischemic cardiomyopathy, but not in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, in fact, this result contrasts to the other observational studies. This study is probably the longest cohort, I think, they conducted in UK, uh, enrolled patient from 2000 to 2017, you know, longest is 16 years, comparing between a patient who got, who got CRTD compared to CRTP. As the overall, it looks like, like CRTD can um, uh, reduce total mortality, heart failure hospitalization, death from heart failure, or even sudden cardiac death. But if you can see in baseline characteristic of these two groups, there are multiple, you know, different in baseline characteristics. So they did the propensity score match for age, sex, New York heart class, New York. Um, well, they only they only observed the benefit of CRTD over CRTP in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, but not in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. These uh, observational studies uh, uh, has identical with this meta-analysis. This is the meta-analysis, which probably in, uh, included the largest number of patients uh, comparing between CRTD, almost 7,000 patients with CRTP, around 3,000 3, patients. 
we reported that uh, there is no significant difference in all cause mortality between these two groups. Well, I think the reason is that non ischemic cardiomyopathy is a broad name. Um, there are multiple underlying cardiac pathologies which carry different um, uh, sudden cardiac death risk. Well, uh, there are the there are uh, ongoing study compa uh, which is a randomized controlled trial comparing between CRTD and C CRTP in low risk of sudden death patient by you know uh, cardiac MRI that that to rule out um, mid wall myocardial scar. This study we finished on 2006, 26, and we probably gonna have to wait for the re result too. Well, so. So far, thanks to last week on ESC, uh, ESC conference, they, uh, they announced the guideline, the new guideline for ventricular arrhythmia and prevention of sudden cardiac death. Uh, they also provide the algorithm for risk stratification for primary prevention in patients with non ischemic, uh, like dilated cardiomyopathy or non ischemic cords. Um, they you know, use the investigations like cardiac MR. Uh, genetic testing, uh, loop recorders, or EP studies, or even family history and certain characteristics of patient to help define high risk of sudden death patient. Well, this is not like the best practice, but this is what I do, do in my practice. Okay. All right, uh, I'll start with patient who has indication for biventricular pacing. I will look at overall investigation and find out what is really caused this this synchrony. If this because of you know uh, electrical this pure electrical this synchrony like left body branch block or light body branch block, I prefer conduction system pacing. Or if this is RV pacing cardiomyopathy, you know I prefer to do conduction system pacing. And also patient with tachy cardiomyopathy, uh, who will you know will do AV notulation, I prefer conduction system pacing first. Uh, for by pacing. Uh, I, would, I would do it as primary strategy in patient with you know, non-specific intraventricular condition delay, uh, patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy with you know, anteroceptor wall scar, you know, have thin of the septum, it will be high risk of perforation and the level of block may be really like, like really low. So that it's, you know, even though you get selective capture of condition system pacing, there's still YQS complex. Uh, finally, you're gonna have to do like optimize left bundle optimize or hip bundle optimize CRT, and also patient with severe dilated RV. You know, it will be it take time for you to get like connection system pacing. So I would prefer biventricular pacing as first strategy. However, it's good to have plan A and plan B because if you feel plan A, you have backup plan. Okay, and let's, let's move to defibrillator. Okay, for primary prevention. If you know echocardiogram shows significant, you know scar, I prefer to put defibrillator in patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy. For non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, there are multiple factors to, to, to consider. You know, like if this is extensive scar, not exclude this one. Okay, uh, for dilated cardiomyopathy, pure. If if you can evaluate scar extension, or if this patient have you know frequent PVC or high burden. PVC or VT, or if you could do genetic study, which I can't in my center, or if patient is very young, especially younger than 75, you know, I would prefer putting the defibrillator. Anyway, it's, you know, leads to patient decision finally. So for my patient, you know, since, you know, I think it's left of the branch block and I think uh, the RCA stenosis did not explain the rejection of ejection fraction and there is no definite scar from echocardiography. So I add the left bundle pacing lead to the patient and then adjust the AV delay to get the narrow SQS complex. And these are echocardiographic three months after you know, adding the leads. The ejection significant improved from 30% to 60, 50 to 60%. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dujlao. As always, uh, very helpful tip from you.
<laughs> so uh, from that one slide, I, I gather that you sometimes, well, in the guidelines, it says, as you have mentioned, um, it can be used as bailout or as you have mentioned, rescue. If we fail to put in the coronary sinus, is that correct? Is my understanding correct that in some patients, sometimes your primary start strategy is yes. uh, conduction system pacing if it's yes. really the synchrony. So, mm -hmm. so there are patients who actually undergo primary conduction system pacing in your yes. case if they're right uh, wide QRS. Yes. Do that. As yes, yes. As um, let me show my slide a little bit. Yeah. What is that? Can I stay? Okay. All right. So as I told, as I show you my slides, this is that my one. the strategy. Yes. Yeah. So since you know <clears throat> as well, since the uh you, I think that there is model uh plenty of the evidence from you know previous data that if you can get like selective uh conduction system pacing, then musician fraction improve in this group of patients, you know, like led by the branch block induced RV pacing cardiomyopathy. So in my practice, I will prefer to do this strategy as the first strategy. And then if I fail, then I move to uh, you know, biventricular pacing. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Jang? Uh, very nice presentation. Yeah. I have a simple question. Uh, do you expect that left bundle uh, conduction system pacing uh, prospectively replace the uh, CLT implantation? Well, if you ask me who like, actually I have to say that I'm dreaming of finding the leads <laughs> which can One have purpose, you know, you know, the, you know, the, that you are able to implant the lead at left bundle, you know, it's just exactly the dream of me. I think personally, as I can show you that ejection, the super response, even normalization in a specific group of patients, you know, especially with electrical dyssynchrony, you collect electrical dyssynchrony directly, probably going to get the better. I think it will, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just my opinion, okay? It will replace, I mean, at least equal, I think, you know, in some group of patients, yeah, yeah, there it is. Like, are we pacing cardiomyopathy? Definitely will. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We just have a few minutes. Let me just try if the remaining speakers who are here would have, uh, would like to have just some reaction or brief conclusion, maybe. Dr. Paul Kitua from the Philippines is still here. Dr. Fukaya from Japan is still here. If you just have uh, some uh, brief reactions or conclusions before you close the program. Okay, I don't think we have any further comments. This was a very enjoyable session. I think you agree, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Du Zhao, you. professor. And Dr. Lee. From the com <laughs> yeah, from the comprehensive talks of our esteemed speakers, we realized that the role of cardiac implantable electronic devices have evolved into just a simple heart rate assurance to prevention of sudden cardiac death, prevention and treatment of heart failure. It's a very exciting field. And the technology is still evolving as we speak, but we must always prioritize patient factors as well, patient safety, and to individualize patient goals. And these were very much emphasized by all our speakers as well. I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I did. On behalf of our organizers, our program director, Professor Jun Lee Lin is here. Would you like to share some message, Professor? No, it's a really, uh, indeed, a very, uh, very attractive <laughs> presentations. Well, I, I really learn a lot, learn a lot because uh, CIED has been uh, quite a common practice for electrical physiologists, but now it seems to be something has to be learned by all cardiologists. You are going to handle your patients with a CIED, even if you are interventioning for coronary or a patient for heart failure care, or even those for AMI team, they also have to know about the ICD. I think it's important. It's a very attractive uh, presentation today. Thank you for both chairmen chairpersons and Thank those you. of our other speakers. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Fukai, would you like to have uh, some final message, doctor? 
Uh, no, in particular. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's <laughs> such a great webinar. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, on behalf of Dr. Jang, then I'm happy to close this session. We'd like to see you in the next APSC Cloud meeting. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank Sam. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Bye bye.